Does anybody else think it's hot in here? Okay, I, I, there has got to be such a thing as manopause. Because I'm having a hot flash up here. Ooh, it is warm. Christy told me she was going to get me a short sleeve shirt for church tomorrow, and I thought, mm, it's probably going to be chilly. Thank you, dear. If you have your Bibles, flip open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> We're starting today a a mini-series, and I say mini because I have plans for it to only be about three Sundays, but I use that word with caution because sometimes God ignores what I think and just does what he will. So we're going to be talking over the next few weeks about our identity. We're going to talk about who are we? And whose are we? Okay? And this is keyed off. Everything that I'm going to be speaking about over the next few weeks is keyed off of this passage, specifically the one verse in here that I'm going to read. We're going to start in verse 16. <coughs> From now on, therefore... We regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now this, this passage right here is kind of the keynote for the Christian experience. Okay, this, these few verses summarize the entire gospel put together into one place. Okay, but the verse I want us to focus on, this is where we're going to start. Verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. There's a, a term that has kind of gone out of vogue in Christian circles. It's called being born again. I'm a born again Christian. Which always struck me as ironic when it was popular because that's like saying I am, I am. I'm born again and a Christian. You can't be the one without the other. It's the same thing. You cannot be a Christian without being born again. And yet, that phrase so marvelously sums up salvation. Because when you come to Christ, you are created anew. And you start off, just as you did in the flesh, you start off as a babe. 
a babe in Christ. Someone that needs parents to nurture and guide them. That is ignorant of the things of life, how things are supposed to work, and oftentimes can't even really feed themselves. <clears throat> See, we come anew. What we were is no more. What we are is something far beyond ourselves. The old us is dead and gone. And the new us is a life knitted together with Christ. So whereas before we looked in the mirror, we saw only ourselves. Now when we look in the mirror, that reflection of who we are, we should see Christ. Now I'm not saying you get up in the morning and you go in to brush your teeth and Jesus is looking back out at you. But in the mirror of reflection of our lives, he has got to be there. Or you're not a Christian. It's that simple. Now, just like in the physical world, we go through a process of growth, maturity, change. We should get past infancy. We should progress through toddlerhood. We should eventually come out of puberty and move into maturity. Now, all of us know people that are stuck in those phases. Some of us have been or are stuck in those phases. I know people that have been saved for decades that are still babes in Christ. And you can tell because a lot of their talk is wah, wah, wah. <laughs> feed me, feed me, feed me, comfort me, clothe me. Wah, wah, wah. They, they provide nothing to anyone else because they are so consumed with being provided for. And then we have the toddlers. And their life is, no, mine. Yes, there she goes, toddling. <laughs> and it's all about them. And they look into the things of God, and they want it for themselves, and they're, uh, they're very good at judging what you don't have. And then you come to puberty. And what should be explosive growth is oftentimes turned inward. And instead of growing into maturity, you just take the immaturity of your childhood with you. And then there are those that grow into maturity. And these are the ones whose fruit multiplies. And you can look at their life and you can see growth. And instead of being so quick to stand up for their rights and their prerogatives, they're willing to give way and let God do as God will. They're not trying to dictate to their father how their lives should go. They're willing to accept what he gives. Now, as a new creation, we, we have to kind of define what this is. And so I'm going to break this down in a number of parts, okay? And today I'm going to try and work out kind of what this new creation is. What, what, what comes of this, okay? So I'm going to bounce through a number of scriptures. Um, if, like I always say, if you miss a scripture or whatever, come talk to me. I'll get you a copy of my notes, okay? So you can kind of look and see where I'm at. Um, so, as a new creation, what are we? Well, I'm going to tell you what we aren't first. This is probably a phrase that you've heard, and if you've read scripture, you should know. But it's not something that I think we really get knitted deep into our hearts. That it becomes a part of our very fabric. As a Christian, 
You are no longer a slave to sin. Do you understand that? Do you know that that's the marked difference between us and them? Is that they have no choice. We have a choice. Romans chapter 6. Flip over there with me if you would. Romans chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm just going to read down a little ways. <coughs> in chapter 5, Paul is talking about how grace reigns. And then in chapter 6, he picks up, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Absolutely not. In the Greek, there is no more clearly negative term than what Paul used here. This is like, uh, in our society, we would ask a rhetorical question. Shall we sin all the more that grace may abound all the more? No! Duh. Okay? So, first, we have to understand that sin is an affliction. It's not a good thing. And there's, it amazes me, absolutely amazes me, some of the garbage that the devil insinuates into church, into church's theology. Because there are churches, and I, I know of one locally, that within the last eight or ten years, propagated this theology that, hey, if where our sin abounds, His grace abounds all the more, I want more of His grace, therefore I'm allowed to sin. We should sin. What? Okay, did, did you miss a part? They said no? I mean, to me, that's not confusing at all. Should we sin... All the more, no, 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 a thousand times, no. I have a child who is now an adult who occasionally, not very often, but occasionally expressed an incredible stubborn streak. And he was about, oh, about 18 months with the fireplace. I think he was just learning how to stand up, so he's about seven months. Oh. Uh, okay, he was little. He was young. <laughs> he was young. And we had a stone fireplace. And it was it looked really nice, but it was like very finely crafted death for a not stable on your feet person. And the children were not allowed to play over by the fireplace, it had a raised hearth, and, and, and the rule was they were not allowed to be over there for two reasons. One, because if there was a fire in there, I didn't want them close to the fire. Two, because it was rock, and my children tend to be clumsy. And I don't want, blood is so hard to clean up. <laughs> and so, this particular child, one day took it in his head, to play on the hearth, and, and he crawled over to the hearth, and he climbed up, and we told him no, we picked him up, and moved him back to the other side of the room, and he threw a fit. Wow, this is not our fit-throwing child. And he crawled back over, and he climbed up. And I said no, well, what? Moved him over, sat down, he threw a fit. And he crawled back over, and he stood back up. And he did this with the audacity to stand up and then look at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Father, check this out. And I looked right back at him. Oh yeah, son, check this out. It was a little bit more firm. Pop on the leg, and over, and sat down. And, ah! Life is unfair! And he crawled back in and stood back up. And this went on. It got to the point where my wife left the room 
and went and hid. <laughs> because at this point, it was no longer about the child's safety. It was about who was going to win. <laughs> Were we going to cave and allow him to do something that we knew to be dangerous just for the sake of peace? Or was he going to cave because he was getting tired of getting his thighs slapped? I'm stubborn. <laughs> and I won. <laughs> And it never happened in the rest of the time that we were in that house that he went over and even tried to climb. It never happened. Okay? But, but that's the same idea here. What then shall we sin all the more that grace may abound? No! No! Do you want to crucify Christ all over again? Let's read further. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You have one master now. And it's not sin. Sin no longer has a hold on you. Now see, here's where the marvelous dichotomy of God works. It's one of those things that is hard for our brains to really grasp. While at one and the same time, God has paid for all of our sin. It is covered. It is done away with. At the same time, we contend with that very sin every day. Every day. Sin wants to fetter us. To bind us away from the Father. Now, you can be a Christian and still be caught in sin. But you will limit your growth. You will severely impact, impair your relationship with God. The intimacy that he desires by being caught in sin. This is why Paul is so emphatic that that old life is gone and a new life has come and we must strive in the strength that God provides. And that's key, folks. It's the strength that God provides to resist sin. It no longer has a hold of us. We have the authority. We have the strength in him to say no. We have an entire life up to salvation where sin was free. It, it, it did what it wanted with us. And we, oh, I never actually did, but you thought it. See, sin is a condition of the heart that only rarely may be enacted in the body. But there's a whole lot more sin that goes in the heart. And that's what Christ dealt with. It's a heart issue. <laughs> So he says here, we know that the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We are no longer its slaves. We have been set free. We have got to grasp that, folks. When life comes against us, when the devil comes after us, when our flesh rises up, which I think is more often the case, we have the very Spirit of God living inside of us that gives us all the authority and the power we need to say no. I will not fall. I will not stumble. And we have access 
to God whereby we can call out, God help me. God strengthen me in this battle. Paul writes often about the struggle, the physical, almost tangible struggle that we have between the flesh and the spirit. But we're no longer enslaved to sin. We've been set free. So the first thing we need to understand, as a Christian, as a new creation, that master is gone. That price has been paid. You've been purchased. You have been redeemed. And now you belong to God and you have his righteousness. You have the authority to not sin. You have that choice. Okay? So, all right. We don't have... We're, we're no longer a slave to sin. But now, we, we just read in uh, 2 Corinthians, we are reconciled to God. He sent his son to reconcile us to himself. Okay? This is very important that we understand this process. Okay? Because in the economy of things, we were the ones that offended God. God did nothing to offend us. We chose first through Adam and then individually each and every one of us chose to become an enemy of God. We rejected him. We chose the way of the world instead of him. Okay? It says that friendship with the world is enmity toward God. You're his enemy. And God, looking down in eternity, knew that we were going to be in such a place and that we were going to desperately need a way out. He also knew we had no way of getting out. We could do nothing in and of ourselves to restore that relationship. Okay, so now normally, in the way things work in this world, if you offend someone, it's your responsibility to go and make things right, right? I mean, isn't that the way it's supposed to work? Well, come on, people. Yeah. If you're a parent here, you're the, you, you know you've taught your children this. You broke Mr. Smith's window, you've got to go and make it right. Okay? And yet God chose to reconcile us to himself. He, who was the offended party, made a way for those who offended him to be made right. He made all the moves. We made none. In discipleship, we have a formula. It's taken right out of Ephesians chapter 2. Thaddeus, what's our formula? Grace plus faith equals salvation as it works. Okay. Grace plus faith equals salvation. Okay. Grace that only God can give is an amazing grace that abounds, that, that it completely covers all of our sin, everything we've done, everything we're doing, everything we will do, all of it's covered at the cross, done, okay? Plus faith, which God gives to us that we might believe, and then there's that little tiny portion of it that is us that says yes. See, God does everything else. But I am absolutely convinced that we have to say yes. Okay? That equals salvation. That's it. Okay? Now, that's a very simple term. Grace plus faith equals salvation. And then after salvation, that goes unto the works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Okay? So you notice that the work is really not part of the equation. Okay? So there's nothing you can do to get to salvation. There's nothing you can do to impress God. Think about it. What can you do to impress God? And we got some people here with some incredible skills. I mean, we've got musicians that are, are incredibly talented. We have artists. We have woodworkers. We have builders. I love 
watching these guys work. They, I look at a project and I go, uh. and they're like, oh yeah, we just do it like this, do, 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 and, and, and it works. It's like, <clears throat> right. We, we were able to go and work on some projects yesterday that a bunch of people got together and <clears throat> I got to wire some light switches. And Matthew told me that, you know, I've got a, <clears throat> what's that thing called? <laughs> you, you touch it and the light goes off. Well, I, I have one of those too. <laughs> you touch it and the light goes off. <clears throat> and I, there, were, there were a lot of wires and we found the hot wire. I found that right off. Yep, that's it. And so I wired that together. And some evil person exposed another one that should not have been exposed. And I found that one too. Okay? And, and then there were several of us gathered around looking at that this does not look like it should. We've got extra things here that are not really, well, they're probably needed because they're there, but why? <clears throat> and so we fiddled with it for a little while. And I got zapped four times. <clears throat> I know, I'm slow. And then we finally decided to talk to the person that knew what was going on, and we called Matthew because he took it apart. And Matthew walked up and he said, oh, that's not supposed to be exposed, that goes right here. <laughs> For whoever exposed that wire, thank you so much. My teeth still feel. <laughs> but we have incredible skills and talents in this church. <coughs> we, got, we, got, we got snake oil people. <laughs> and they know every kind of oil there is out there to do anything. I know vegetable oil and motor oil. And don't mix the two. Okay? But, you know, oh, hey, you, you got Eric, hey, let's do this. And those people make me nervous. And they, and they open up this thing, and it, it looks like something out of the Dark Ages. And we're going to mix a little of this, and we're going to mix a little of this, and you're going to feel all better. I think I'd just rather have the earache. But the things that they know are incredible. And, and, and you know that they know them because they all agree on them. And it's like they're speaking a foreign language. They need this and this and this and this. Oh, yes, and, and maybe we could add a little of this. And I'm going, ah. I'm never telling them there's anything wrong with me ever again. <laughs> I'm doing great. But we have people that have incredible skills. And yet none of those skills can in any way impress God. None of those skills can merit salvation. I mean, you think about it. Think about the temple that Solomon built. The entire interior was covered with gold. The, the, the entire room was covered in gold. And yet that was merely a shadow of what heaven has. When the, the, the instructions were given to Moses, God was very particular because it was going to be a replica of what already existed in heaven. Okay. And so when it comes to salvation, we have nothing to offer. We have nothing to bring to the table except yes. Okay. So in this whole thing of reconciliation, God being the offended party made a way, a way that he paid everything for that we could have salvation. So, so God is the reconciler. Our relationship with God is reconciled. We can have intimacy with the Almighty God. And if that doesn't stir you up, then you don't understand what Christianity is about. Okay? You don't understand just how awesome a God we have if you don't have intimacy with Him. If you don't get excited about the potential to have an opportunity to dwell in the presence of God, even for an instant, <coughs> much less for all of eternity, then you don't understand God. I'm, not, I'm actually going to take a break. I'm stopping right here because I'm going to issue a challenge. Okay? I have been praying, 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 praying for revival in this body. First, this body. Okay? And then this body. 
I want to offer a challenge today. Okay? And this, I'm, I'm taking this challenge myself. As a matter of fact, God kind of started me on this a couple days ago. But I'm going to go from this Sunday, right now, to next Sunday. I want you to put away your books, your internet, your television, any of those things that you devote your time and attention to. And I want you to replace it with reading the word, praying, worshiping. Okay? I want you to turn off the news. I want you to put down the newspaper. Don't worry about the politics. It'll still be there. It's going to run along fine without you. Okay? Don't worry about your cooking show or whatever neat thing is there. Lay it all down for one week. And then fill that time with a growing intimacy with God. Okay? Get in the Word. Don't just do your little two-minute devotional. Get in the Word. Read it. Research it. Study it. You're not sure how to study the Word? We have got people in this church that can get you going. We have got resources in the library. Library is very close to being opened. We've got to reorganize the books and get them in order. It's very, very close. But I'll tell you what, I will get those books into your hand right now today if you need them. Okay? Spend time in prayer. Come up with a prayer plan. Write a prayer plan. Okay? I've got a prayer plan. And I've got things that I pray for consistently every day. And then on another page, I have things that God just brings to my attention on a particular day. And I write them down. So that on the next day I can go back and I can pray over those things. And then God gives me more. And I write them down. I have a plan. I don't just go with whatever happens to be in my mind at the moment. Because there are certain things that I think need prayer consistently. This church. You guys. Praying for you guys. Consistently. I'm praying for our nation. I'm praying for the church. Not just this church. I'm praying for Christ's body all over this world. I'm praying for Israel. I am praying that God would restore to them the remembrance of the covenant that he made with them. That they are his people and he is their And that as they turn to him and they begin to research the scriptures and they begin to have relationship with him, they would see that the promise of the Messiah has been filled. I'm praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Because God says to. I don't know why. He says to. God doesn't, you ever notice, God doesn't give us a lot of whys. He just gives us do. Okay? There are just things that God has placed. I pray over my wife every day. And some days he has me pray for something very particular, but then, then there are the, the general prayers that I pray over her every day. I pray for my children every day. I pray for my grandchildren. I pray for their salvation every day. Because as much as I would like to see them grow into productive, good people, I am much more concerned about their eternity. And so I've, I've got a chart that I go through every day, and then I have my daily prayers. I have had to lay down my books again and I, I placed Bibles strategically throughout the house. So when I don't have anything to do, and I, my natural inclination would be to pick up a book, 
and there's the Bible. I can pick it up and I can read it. And in those few minutes that I may have reading, I, I go to the Psalms. But when I have more time in depth, I go to something more in depth. We've been working on Galatians in uh, discipleship. We're working through the, the A.W. Tozer book in Brothers Meeting, The Pursuit of God. Um, there's, there, you know, disciplining yourself to make time for God. And not just that little five minute slice of the pie so you can get on to more important things. Making God the most important thing in your life. Husbands, lead your wives. Initiate prayer with your wife. Uncomfortable praying out loud with her? Pray simply. Father, today I am asking you to bless my wife. Start there. Maybe have a discussion of things that you should pray for. You know, we're, we're considering um, some kind of a deal, a transaction. <clears throat> We're going to pray together that God would lead us in this. There are situations going on with people that we know. We're going to pray together for this. Read the word together. Don't have to get, you know, if, if neither of you are very good readers, get an audio Bible. You can get them online. Let somebody that can actually read, read it, and, and you guys go through it together. Share it. Share with your children. Those still in your home and those out of your home. Make a point to share with your friends. Make God an important topic with the people you talk about stuff with. You know? Everybody wants to talk politics, I, and I understand it. It's a political season. Everybody wants to talk sports. And, and those are not necessarily in and of themselves bad things. But God is so much better. And it, it's time that we give him the prioritization that he deserves. Number one. Number one. So I'm issuing a challenge this week. Turn off the television. Turn off the internet. Lay down the books and the newspaper, the magazines. And replace him for this week <coughs> with his word with conversation with him, and with worship of him. Set music on that will bring you to worship. Set a playlist of songs that you know that just, just open your heart to singing out to God. Okay? That's, that's just three things. It's very simple. The word, the relationship, the worship. Okay? Now, I'm not going to be coming to your house, checking over your shoulder. I'm not going to look at your internet logs. You know, that, this, honestly, this is between you and him. That's where it should be. Okay? So that's, that's my challenge to you this week. Lay everything down and, and look to grow in intimacy with God. Look to understand him more. Look to be more intimate with him. All right? Father, we bless you this morning. And I thank you, God, that you have given us a new identity. We are a new creation. You have marked us. And you have worked in us marvelous changes. <clears throat> and you desire even more yet that we would become more and more like Christ. That our thinking would be more like his. That our hearts would be like his. I thank you that you have given us your spirit to lead us, to prompt us, to convict us, to teach us. We are not alone. And you have placed us you have strategically placed us in fellowship with one another. And I ask, Lord God, that you would respond this week 
Father, in some way, for each person that takes up this challenge, I'm asking, Lord God, you would respond. And I ask also, Father, for protection from the enemy. Because as we seek to draw near to you, he will come very quickly against us. Cover us with the shield of your favor. We bless you this morning, Father, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.